Hello everyone, welcome to chapter 8. In this chapter, let's discuss electromagnetic induction. So in this chapter, we'll talk about electricity from magnetism, generators, motors and mutual inductance. And we'll talk also talk about AC circuits and transformers. And finally end the lecture with electromagnetic or electromagnetic waves. So let's start with electricity from magnetism. So after you complete this section, you should be able to recognize the that relative motion between a conductor and a magnetic field induces an EMF in the conductor. You should able to be you should be able to describe the change in the number of magnetic field lines through a circuit loop and how it affects the magnitude and direction of the induced electric current. And finally, apply Lenz's law and Faraday's law of induction to solve problems involving induced EMF and current. So let's start with electromagnetic induction. So electromagnetic induction is the process of creating a current in a circuit by changing its magnetic field. So I'm going to repeat this again. Electromagnetic induction is basically the process of creating current. Remember that before from current we had magnetic field. In induction from magnetic field we are creating current. So why does it happen? This is the preamble to the main pro property of the main law which we call the Faraday's law of induction, which basically states that at any change in the EMF, any change in the magnetic flux through a conductor induces an electrical current in the conductor. So this happens because of the separation of charges by the magnetic force that induces an EMF. Now, what happens here is the angle of the magnetic field and the circuit will affect the amount of induction that occurs. So this here is what we generally call it as the change in the number of magnetic field lines induces a current. So here what we are try trying to do is we are trying to make sure that we can change the number of magnetic field lines that can cut a certain area of that particular uh, loop for example. So let's say for example if this is the current and this is the magnetic field poking out of the page and let's say the loop is traveling with a velocity v that can induce a current so these are all the ways of inducing a current now the main law that can tell us about what type of current is induced here we call that the lenz's law so lenz's law basically states that the magnetic field of induced current is in the direction that produces the field direction to produce the field and that opposes the change that is causing it. So remember that this is how we can decide on this. So the magnetic field of induced current is in a direction that is perpendicular to that is in opposition to the field that produces the position. So which means that the induced current does not oppose the applied field, but rather it tries to change, tries to create a change in the applied field. Now, so what is the what are the characteristics of this induced EMF? So the first one is the magnitude. The magnitude of an induced EMF can be predicted by using the Faraday's law of magnetic induction, so which is the precursor to all of electromagnetic induction. So which basically says that the EMF is proportional to the rate of change of the magnetic flux. So we call phi m, we call it the magnetic flux. So magnetic flux basically is the number of field lines that pass through a given area. So we, the, we can write it as phi m equals B a times cos theta. So where B is the magnetic field, A is the area, so which is which becomes phi m. Now here EMF, if you remove the proportionality, you get negative n. n here is the number of loops of wire that is connected. So the EMF that is generated in that coil can be given by the formula EMF equals negative n delta phi m by delta t. The reason we put the negative sign involves the indication of the Lenz's law which basically states that it always travels in the direction opposite to the field that produces that change. So let's try and solve a problem so that we can understand this much better. So here you have a coil with 25 turns of wire and it is wrapped around a hollow tube with an area of 1.8 meter square. Each turn has the same area as the tube. So a uniform magnetic field is applied at a right angle 
to the plane of the coil. If the field increases uniformly from 0.0, .0 to 0 0.55 Tesla in 0 0.85 seconds, find the magnitude of the induced EMF in the coil. And if the resistance is 2.5 ohm, find the magnitude of the induced current in the coil. So let's start with the basic data in the problem. So the total time that takes is 0 0.85 seconds. Initial magnetic field is 0 0.00. Final magnetic field is 0 0.55. There is 25 turns in the coil and an area of 1.8 meter square with a resistance of 2.5 ohm and an angle of 0 degrees. So now remember the reason why it is 0 degrees is because it is at right angle with the structure. So right angle here represents that it is a 0 degree structure because remember that the angle is between the parallel, the perpendicular to the plane. So that is the reason why it is 0 degrees. So write down the formula now. So the formula for EMF is negative m delta phi m by delta t. So negative n here is 25 turns. So let me copy this data so that we have it in hand. So this is the data that we need. So we have negative n is 25 times delta phi m becomes change in ba by delta t. So remember that phi m is generally ba cos theta. So minus 25 times ba cos theta can be written as the only thing that changing is b here. So we can take a cos theta out which is constant and it becomes delta b by delta t. So minus 25 times a the area given is 1.8 meter square times cos theta is cos 0 degrees times delta b is bf minus bi which is going to be 0 0.55 divided by delta t becomes 0 0.85 seconds. So now calculate the entire value. So you start with 25 times cos 0 is 1. So you have 25 times 1.8 times 0 0.55 divided by 0 0.85 equals 29.18 so the e this is emf remember that emf is in volt so this is the the number of volts so which you can round it off to negative 29 and if you want to write it to be negative 29.12 it's fine now what else is given they also given us the resistance we know that v equals IR. So V here becomes EMF. So EMF equals IR. We are finding I here which is the induced current. So I here becomes EMF by R. EMF is minus negative 29.12 divided by R is 2.51. So 29.12 divided by 2.5. So that value becomes negative 11.648 amps. So the current I, the induced current has a value of negative 11.648 amperes. So this is how we can find the value. So let's discuss the next topic. You have generators, motors and mutual inductance. So after you complete this lecture, you should be able to describe how generators and motors operate. And second, you should be able to explain the energy conversions that take place in generators and motors. And finally, describe how mutual induction occurs in circuits. So let's start with the generator. So what is a generator? A generator basically is a machine that can convert one energy form into another. So which is mechanical energy into electrical energy. So generators use induction to convert mechanical energy into electrical energy. So the principle again is still the same induction. So the induction principle here is that a generator generally produces a continuously changing EMF. So the continuously changing EMF produces a type of current we generally call the alternating current.
So generators only produce continuously changing EMF and this continuously changing EMF is what causes it to form current here. So what happens here is that when you rotate the current inside a magnetic field, the magnetic field produces a force on each end of the wire. So for example, if you consider that if this is a coil, so the coil produces, so on this wow in the magnetic field, so when it's in a magnetic field like this, so it pushes it downward this way and on this end it pushes it upward. So this creates what we generally call a circular motion or rotatory motion and this rotatorial motion that originally that was created, so when you rotate it inside a magnetic field, it continuously changes the EMF. So when it continuously changes the EMF, that in turn produces a continuously cutting uh, magnetic field so this continuously changing EMF then creates the induced current. So that current is what we enjoy it as electrical energy. So this is a basic functionality of a generator. So the current that is produced is alternating current and is it is generally an electrical current that changes direction at regular intervals. So for example if you consider with time if you take the current graph this here is a graph of an example of direct current. An alternating current would alternate between positive and negative values continuously. So this is an example of an AC current, alternating current. So depending on the generator we can change it to create DC generators as well. So the only difference is that in an AC generator we use slip rings and brushes. In a DC generator we use a commuter. So commuter basically changes the graph in such a way that rather than producing continuously changing current, the cycles are always in the same direction. So when they are in the same direction, when you take the average value, the average value produces a DC current. Now let's talk about motors. Motors do the exact opposite of a generator. Motors take in electrical energy and convert it into mechanical energy. So the arrangement is exactly similar to that of generators. So there is what we call as a back EMF that is generated. This back EMF is the EMF induced in a motor's coil that tends to reduce the current that is passing through the coil. So what we are doing here is we pass current through the coil and keep it inside a magnetic field. The magnetic field when it uh, when applies a certain force and this force produces a rotatory motion. So the magnetic, the changing EMF here, the changing current here present inside a magnetic field produces a rotatory motion. So this is caused due to what we call mutual inductance. Mutual inductance is the ability of one circuit to induce an EMF in a nearby circuit. So clearly understand this, it's the ability of one circuit to induce an EMF in the other circuit in the presence of a changing current. The reason we need a changing current is because changing current produces changing magnetic field. And the magnetic field that is generated by one coil affects the other coils circuits by producing current in that coil. So this is how the mutual inductance phenomenon works. So the formula for mutual inductance is minus m times delta i by delta t. So m here is called as the coefficient of mutual inductance. Delta i here is the change in current and change in current over change in time. So that is about mutual inductance. Next let's talk about AC circuits and transformers. So what are AC circuits here? So let's talk about what we call effective current. Effective current in general is called as the RMS current. The RMS current of a circuit is the value of alternating current that gives the same heating effect as that of the corresponding value of direct current. So this is a general value. This general value is given by the maximum current by root 2 which is about 70.7% of the maximum current produced by that circuit. So the RMS current and the RMS EMF are in an AC circuit are the most important measures to describe the characteristics of an AC circuit. So the resistance here also influences an AC circuit. So when you take instantaneous values we can generally call it delta V and delta I. The maximum value is delta V max and delta I max, sorry I max. RMS value is 1 root, so divided by square root 2. 1 over root 2 times the maximum value gives you the RMS value which is about 70.7%. Now let's take a problem and let's try to solve using the formulas. So a generator 
with a maximum output of 205 volts connected to 150 ohm resistor. So calculate the RMS potential difference and find the RMS current through the resistor and also find the maximum AC current in the circuit. Right. So what is the RMS current here value here 205 volts and the resistance is 150 ohms. So we want to know the RMS voltage. So sorry this is maximum. So this is the maximum value. So the RMS value we have to find I RMS and I max. Now so the formula first we want to find is what, what is given here we have V, v max which is 205 volts and resistance which is 115 ohm. Now we are, have to find I RMS, I max and delta v rms so let's start with delta v rms which is the simpler one is delta v max by root 2 so which is 205 by root 2 so which can also be written as 0 0.707 times 205 so 0 0.707 times 205 is 144.9 volts so 144.9 volts if you count it off to the nearest uh, significant figure you get 145 volts so this is delta v rms is can be written as 145 volts now we want to find i max so we already know the formula v equal to i r so we we are only using the maximum value so i max becomes v max so delta v max divided by r delta v max is 205 by r is 115 so 205 divided by 115 becomes 1.78 amperes so this is the i max so i rms is 0 0.707 i max so which is going to be 0 0.707 times 1.78 So, which becomes 1.26 amps. So, the what are the values that we have in one single space? So, delta V RMS, we found it to be 145 volts. I max is 1.78 amps. I RMS is 1.26 amps. So, this is your answer. So this is your answer. Now let's discuss the next concept transformer. So what is a transformer? A transformer is a device that is used to increase the amount of current that passes through the increases the EMF or decreases the EMF. So a transformer is an EMF altering device. So it's a device that can increase or decrease the EMF of the alternating current. So the reason the relationship between input and output EMF is given by what we call the transformer equation which is delta V2 by delta so delta V2 by delta V1 equals N2 by N1. So this is the formula delta V2 by delta V1 becomes equal to N2 by N1. So where delta V2 is the number N2 is the number of turns in the secondary coil and N1 is the number of turns in the primary coil. So what would a transformer look like for example let's say a transformer is made of a iron laminate so you have sheets of iron pieces cut into rectangular rings and on one side you have the primary coil and on the other side you have the secondary coil so this here the voltage here is delta v1 the voltage between these two parts is delta v2 and here the number of turns is n1 here the number of turns is n2 now here if n2 is greater than n1 what will happen so automatically delta v2 will be greater than delta v1 if n2 is less than n1 then automatically delta v2 will be less than delta v1 
So when n2 is greater than n1, we call that a step up transformer. And when n2 is less than n1, we call that a step down transformer. So step up transformers are generally used in power stations to increase the voltage and step down transformers are used around localities uh, near your neighborhoods to decrease the amount of voltage and bring it back to the normal voltage of 120 volts or 240 volts depending on the country you live in. So this is how in general it works. Now transformers they generally assume that, the, that no power is lost between the primary and secondary coils but in reality there is little bit of efficiency loss that efficiency loss turns into heat that's the reason why uh, transformers are generally dipped in uh, heating agents uh, cooling agents such as oil or grease the reason mainly is because to reduce the amount of heat and cause uh, not cause any uh, you know failures so real transformers typically have efficiencies ranging from about 90 to 99 percent so the most common one is the ignition coil in a gasoline engine it's also a form of a transformer So now let's go to the last topic, electromagnetic waves. So what is an electromagnetic wave and what is the propagation of electromagnetic waves? So electromagnetic waves are the waves that travel at the speed of light and are associated with oscillating perpendicular electric and magnetic fields. So a com combination of perpendicular electrical and magnetic fields oscillating in free space is what we call an electromagnetic wave. So electromagnetic waves are transverse waves which means they behave the same as light waves and the direction of the travel here is perpendicular to the direction of oscillating magnetic oscillating electric and magnetic field for example if this is the direction of the electric field and this is the direction of the magnetic field then perpendicular to both of them will be the direction of propagation of the field so this is how the propagation in general works so this is an example here. The yellow that you see here represents the electric field. The blue here represents the magnetic field and the red here represents the velocity and the direction of propagation of the wave. So this is a crude example of an electromagnetic field. Now all electromagnetic waves are generally produced by accelerating charges. So electromagnetic waves, what are they special about? Of? They, have, they can transfer energy. The energy of electromagnetic waves is stored in the waves oscillating electric and magnetic fields. Now, this here is what we call an electromagnetic radiation is the transfer of energy that is associated with electric and magnetic fields. So this radiation varies periodically and it also travels at the speed of light. So this is an example of the sun at different wavelengths of radiation and how it looks like when you use different, different waves to look at the sun. So what are, so high energy electromagnetic waves, they can behave as particles and an electromagnetic wave's frequency makes the wave behave more like a particle. So this notion is what we call as a wave particle duality. So to explain this was the first person to explain this was Einstein who named it a photon. So photon here is a unit or a quantum of light. So photons can be thought as particles of electromagnetic radiation. They generally have zero mass and they carry about one quantum of energy. So that energy is given by the Planck's law, which we will discuss in the next uh, chapter. Now the electromagnetic spectrum generally ranges from very long radio waves to very short, wave, very short wavelength gamma waves. Now the electromagnetic spectrum has a wide variety of applications and characteristics. So best example of this is to look at all the waves that are possible there. So the first one is the radio waves which has the highest uh, freq highest wavelength and lowest frequency. So we are going we are, we are going in increasing frequency and decreasing wavelength. Remember this part. So radio waves are the ones that have low frequency high wavelength. So these are generally used for communications and television. Next you have microwaves which are about 30 centimeters to 1 millimeter in wavelength. And they are generally used for radars and cell phones. You also have infrared ray, infrared radiation, which is about one millimeter to 700 nanometers, which is generally used for heat and photography. You have visible light, which is about 700 nanometer to 400 nanometer, which is about WIBGR, which is violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. These are the visible lights that you can see. 
So optical microscopy is the best example and application of visible light and everything that you see are able to see is because of visible light. Next you have ultraviolet right? Ultraviolet radiation generally ranges from 400 to 60 nanometers. Most commonly it's used for disinfection and uh, ultraviolet spectroscopy and organic chemistry is one place where you might see ultraviolets as well. Next you have x-rays which change about 60 nanometers to 10 power negative 4 nanometers. They are most commonly used for medicine for diagnosis, astronomy and security screening. Next you have gamma rays. Gamma rays they generally have less than 0.1 nanometer and these are used for cancer treatment and astronomy. So these are the common electromagnetic spectrum and this is the diagram that shows you the electromagnetic spectrum and the comparison in terms of the wavelength of where the light where you can see the light. So you go from really small really high wavelengths to really small wavelengths. So where you are starting from radio waves to the other side which has the shortest wavelength which is gamma ray. So as the wavelength decreases the frequency will increase. Remember this principle. So this is about electromagnetic spectrum. So with that we end our lecture on electromagnetic induction.